So interfaces are one of the most common things you will use and understanding them is a real must. But mastering everything, including interface composition or the combination of errors and interfaces or even understanding the io.reader and io.writer interfaces can be really challenging, especially for beginners. That's why I've decided to make this video your last video about Golang interfaces. Oh, and by the way, if you're new here, my name is Flo, I'm a professional software engineer and on this channel we do everything related to the software engineering world. So let's quickly start by looking at some basics of when and why to use interfaces in Golang. So you can think of interfaces like contracts, for instance, of methods for specific types like structs. And these interfaces provide some kind of high level organization without really implementing the business logic of these methods. So by just defining the declarations or the definitions of these methods that the structs should implement. And this sort of flexibility and kind of grouping of these methods gives us developers a really nice flexibility and high level organization. And a struct, for instance, like I said before, can implement these interfaces by just embedding or implementing the logic of these methods that were defined in the interface. And as long as the struct has these specific methods in the interface, the struct also directly implements this interface. So let's quickly take a look at what interfaces are in Golang code. All right, I've got here an empty Golang test project. And what we are going to do now is to simulate a shape interface. And in the end, we do want to have a rectangle and circle, for instance, that implement the area function. And obviously a rectangle has a different area equation compared to the circle equation. So let's quickly define an interface here. So for that, I'm just going to make use of the type keyword here. And generally the type keyword in Golang just means that now a new type definition starts. And here again, like in a struct, for instance, the visibility matters. So for instance, if we capitalize our name of the interface, then obviously this interface will be public. However, if we just start small, so for instance, we say shape, this interface will be private. For now, I will just make it public and then say interface. And with that, we actually now got a new interface. Now, what we're going to do is just to define the contract of our shape that for instance, the rectangle or circle should implement. And like I said before, we are going to make use of the area calculation here. And with that in mind, we're just going to define a function in our interface. And here it is really important that we are only going to define the function definition without any implementation. So we're going to say area, that's basically it. And obviously we can define the return type here. So for instance, we say float 64. And now we got our first contract method in our shape interface. So let's quickly define two structs. The first one is our rectangle. And this just includes the width and the height, which are both float 64s. And then we obviously got a circle. And this circle just receives for now the radius. All right, now we got our two structs, which obviously are some shape and we have to implement this area function. Now it's important to know that for now Golang does not know or the Golang compiler does not know that rectangle and circle actually accept the contract of our shape interface. So how can we achieve this contract implementation here? So there is no specific keyword. Like I said in the beginning, we are just going to implement this shape area function in our two structs and then we accept the contract of our shape interface. So for instance, we are going to declare a struct method here by just using R and then we say rectangle and then we say area and here is the return type float 64. And with that implementation, we now kind of accept or implement the shape interface by just defining this function. So let's implement the logic here by just saying return r.width times r.height. Now this obviously is the basic area calculation of a rectangle. So with that in mind, 
What for instance can happen if we implement a new method here or we refactor the shape interface to have a new method, for instance, let's say ABC, then obviously the rectangle does not anymore accept the contract of our shape interface because obviously the ABC method is missing in our rectangle struct. But if we remove this ABC method, the area method gets implemented by our rectangle and therefore a rectangle is now a shape. All right, let's do the same thing with our circle. So we say func, then we define the simple struct method here and then we just calculate the area of a circle. Now let's quickly make use of these two structs here and obviously of our brand new interface the shape interface. So let's just create a rectangle and circle. Let's just say rect is a rectangle and here we say width 5 and height 4 and then we define a circle which is of type circle struct and here we say radius 2. And now we obviously want to call these area functions. Right, but let's just say that we have a new function which should call these area functions in our structs. So let's say we declare a function called calculate shape or let's call it calculate area. And this function is pretty generic because it can accept as a function argument a shape interface. So let's say s and then shape and then in the end we are just going to return a float 64. And in the end, we are just going to call s.area. So what does this function even mean here? First, this calculate area function has as an argument a shape. So in the end, there should be like some sort of type or struct as the argument which accepts and implements the shape interface or contract. And then in the end, we just call this function definition which will be, for instance, the circle area function. So if you're just going to say, for instance, fmt.println, and in here we're going to say rectangle area, and then we say calculate area, and now we say rect, this function calculate area gets called with our rect struct, so the rectangle struct, and in the end, the rectangle struct area function is going to get called instead of just a plain interface function here. And because obviously the rectangle implements the shape interface, this calculate area function is going to work with our rectangle struct. Let's do the same thing with our circle and this will now basically work, right? So if we are just going to run our project here, we get the correct rectangle area and obviously also the correct circle area. So we now kind of have a generic shape interface and two shape structs, which are a rectangle and a circle. And then we've defined a pretty generic function, which is called calculate area. And this function takes in an argument, which will be an implementation of the shape interface, which in this case could be the rectangle or circle. And then we are just going to call the area function, which is implemented by our rectangle and circle. All right, with that in mind, we can do a lot more with interface types because an interface type can hold pretty much any value. So for instance, we can say mystery box and then we can say interface. Now this looks pretty weird, but in the end interface with this curly braces is just the empty type, which can hold any type. And then we say 10 and this now here just holds the interface value 10. Now you might think, why is this even necessary? So let's just create a function here. Now we are going to call it describe value. And this describe value function just takes in an T, which is an interface, just an empty interface. And this empty interface basically means that it can accept any type. Now obviously in Golang there are generics, so this is a pretty broad implementation. And I obviously don't really recommend this, so use generics as much as possible because they obviously have their use case. But now, for instance, we can make a fancy printf statement. And in here we say, for instance, type and then value. And in here we will just use t and t. So in the end, it will just print the type of the past in value and the value itself. So let's just test this by just calling it describe value. 
and then we say mystery box. And now if we run this code, we will get the type int and value 10. And this is pretty neat. Now obviously we can do a lot more with that. So for instance, we can do type assertions here. So let's just say retrieved int and okay. Now this is pretty advanced, but with that syntax here, we can try to cast our mystery box, which is of type interface or any type to an int. And if this succeeds, we can do something like for instance, print line and then we say retrieved int. And here the type is directly an integer, which is also pretty nice. So we don't have to do anything else here. But if it fails, so if the mystery box is not an integer, then for instance, we can just say value is not an integer. Now, if we're going to run this, obviously it says retrieved end, and this is pretty good. But if we just say that the mystery box is a string, and then we are going to print this again, we're going to get first of the type string, and then value is not an integer. And with that in mind, we can not only use the interface here as some sort of contract, but we can also use this interface as somehow a generic type. So it can also be any type if we use this specific syntax here. All right, these were the basics of interfaces in Golang. Let's quickly go into a more advanced use case. So I'm just going to quickly clean up this code here. And let's just say we don't need to circle anymore because now we are going to make use of interface composition or more likely embedding interfaces into each other. So for that, we are just going to define a new interface. Let's just call it measurable. And this measurable interface just takes in a definition of the parameter function here. And let's just create a third interface and we are going to call this geometry. Now here it is pretty nasty because we can embed interfaces into each other. So for instance, we kind of want to inherit or compose the measurable and shape interface into our geometry interface. So for instance, we want to say that the geometry interface should have the definitions of our shape and measurable interface. And this way we create an interface to combine multiple interfaces. And this is pretty neat because I'm going to show you why this is even powerful here. So with that, we can just say shape and measurable, and then we basically embedded interfaces into each other. So the geometry interface now has the function of our shape interface and measurable interface. All right, let's, let's quickly remove the circle here, and then we are going to implement the parameter function for our rectangle struct. All right, now we got our parameter function for our rectangle struct. So now the rectangle struct here accepts the contracts of our measurable interface because we do have the parameter function and the shape interface because obviously we do have the area function. All right, and now we want to actually refactor the calculate error method to be describe shape because we just want to print, for instance, the parameter and area function of a geometry interface. So no matter what, we always want to call the parameter function and area function. So we're just going to say G and then geometry. And in the end, we are going to say fmt.println. And in here, we are going to say area and then g.area. And the same with the parameter. And this now obviously works because geometry embeds the shape interface and measurable interface. So we can call these two functions area and perimeter without any additional logic. And now what we're going to say is just say describe shape and then we call rect, right? And this now works because rectangle fulfills the contracts of our measurable and shape interface because in the end we do have an area implementation and a perimeter implementation for our rectangle struct. And if we're going to run this we're just going to see area and parameter. All right, one more thing I actually wanted to show you is using error interfaces in our Golang code. And with that in mind, we can just declare a new struct, let's just say calculation error, and this struct is going to have a message, which is just a string, because obviously we want to describe the error as much as possible here. And then we are going to implement or use the error function, the error struct function. 
So we are just going to say CE for instance, calculation error. And then we're going to say error and the return type is a string. And in here, we're just going to say return CE dot message. And this is a pretty common pattern you will see in huge Golang code bases. Because I'm going to show you that a native Golang error actually only implements or is some sort of interface, right? And this interface has a definition of this specific error function here. So let's just create, for instance, a new function and say perform calculation. And then we're going to say the value, which is a float 64. And the return type is a tuple where we do have a float 64 as the calculated value and maybe a possible error. And this is also a pretty common pattern you will see in Golang here, right? Let's just say if the value is less than zero, obviously we do not want to perform the calculation for whatever reason. We're just going to say zero as the default value for our return float 64. And then we're going to say calculation error with the message invalid input. Now, if not, we are just going to say, for instance, the square root of our value and the error will be nil. Okay, let's quickly go into dev here, what we've actually done. So the error type is in the end, just an interface which uses, which uses the error function definition. So if you're going to go into the source code of Golang, we are going to see this definition here. Right? So we have an interface, which is the error. And this interface has the error definition with a return type of type string. And here we have our contract, right? And because we now implement in our calculation error, the error function with the exact same definition of this error interface, this calculation error is now a valid error in our Golang code. And that's why this function here does not give us any specific error that was returned by the compiler, right? This works because we implement the error function of the error interface. All right, now these were some important advanced interface concepts you actually have to understand to fully master interfaces in Golang. And clearly there are more interfaces like IO Reader and IO Writer. So feel free to experiment with these two interfaces on your own. Now, right next to the Golang interfaces are actually structs, right? And luckily I've made a video about them. So feel free to check out this video here if you want to know everything about Golang structs. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day and bye-bye.